uh, the dialogue that we find in the Bible between Genesis and, and Job is a dialogue that should be continued among us in communities of faith out into the larger world and the public arena as the fight for life in all of its forms must be, must be furthered and advanced if we are to move ahead together for the sake of creation and for our own sake, for the sake of the diversity of life and the for sake of the diversity of the human species as well. So thank you. And uh, uh, yeah, I think we've gone a little over time. I, I forgive you for that, but I'm here to hang with you as long as you are able to hang with me. That's okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. That was truly wonderful, literally marvelous, uh, especially at the end there. So thank you so much. Um, to lead our discussion time, we have six of our current students, myself included, and our uh, Doctor of Ministry in Land, Food, and Faith Formation program. And so a lot of what you just um, uncovered for us, Dr. Brown, relates in very significant ways to what we're studying and what we're aiming to do through our learning here at MTS. So um, I will open it up to um, any of our students who would like to ask a first question. Well, I, all right. I'm a brave one in this one. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brown. What a great presentation. I love the chapters that we had the opportunity to uh, read. Uh, and the first thing came to mind for me was, as you juxtaposed uh, uh, Greek mythology uh, along with theology, and my first day at Memphis Theological Seminary to get my master's in divinity, uh, my first day and first class was uh, with Dr. Uh, Steve Parrish, uh, Old Testament professor. I think he's on here now. And the first question he asked us was about Genesis. And God says, let us make humankind in our image. And he asked us, he said, who is the us? Because, you know, there was no Jesus then, there, the Holy Spirit wasn't mentioned, you know, we all struggle with that question. And he began to talk about Greek mythology and how it plays a role in the biblical text, and you've done it also. And you mentioned it a little bit, and you left me with the exact same thing to wonder who is the us. You did give us a little bit more uh, to talk about it could be, you know, this, that, or the other, but at the end, uh, it never say who God counsel is. I think you put it better, uh, angelic, uh, let me, I wrote it down here, uh, angelic angels or divine assembly. Uh, but there was no mention in that. And I understand the chronological order or the, the Bible only, they was writing just for facts, not as in all of it. Uh, I wanted you to say a little bit more. I don't know if you can or uh, would you would. Who is the actual us? Is it left us to, left left up to us, just as theologians, to struggle with that question? Uh, because even when we go to uh, Psalms and Job and things of that nature, I guess we're trying to pull it all together, but it's no clear statement. And with the Greek mythology locked in there uh, to show the parallelisms, uh, how the writers might have been influenced. Uh, yeah, th thank you, Stephen. Uh, I, I intentionally left that question open. Uh, for one thing, we did not have enough time to deal with it. Uh, but I continue to like, I continue to keep that question open. Um, my, my main point was that God continues to collaborate throughout the process of creation. Um, uh, as we see with marine life and aviary life, um, uh, land life, enlisting the earth and the waters as creative agents within their own right. God likes to work, or we might say that God does not like to work alone. Uh, now for sure, the creation of lights begins the process. So it seemingly is just God and darkness and the watery depths and God unleashes light. That's one way of perhaps translating chapter one, verse three. But then when it comes to humankind, even humankind is a collaborative project on the part of God. So God is continuing to enlist other creative agents, whoever they are, whatever they are. And so you're right, Stephen, that in the Christian tradition, uh, irrespective of chronology and the history of religion and, and the like, um, uh, 
uh, the church has always said that's the Trinity at work, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or creator, sustainer, and redeemer. And so the Trinity represents the collaborative, collaborative work of God. Um, and, and, and I'm okay with that. Um, theologically, if you want to talk more in terms of religious history, uh, you, you, you have to include the divine assembly in that makeup. And so, yes, you're right. In Genesis, we don't have explicit reference to the divine assembly like we do, for instance, in the first two chapters of Job, in which the literally the sons of God, or I would call them the godlings, uh, uh, the Bnei Eloha, the Bnei Elohim, uh, are they arrayed around the throne of God? And one member of that divine assembly pops up to engage God in conversation in chapters one and two. And who is that? None other than the Satan as a member of the divine assembly who has a specific role uh, to play out. Uh, and so we do have other ancient traditions. Um, you're right, uh, the, the, it was the, the Greek pantheon, but uh, for biblical scholars, it's, it's, we're more at home with uh, uh, the Canaanite mythology or the uh, West and East Semitic uh, mythologies that populate the divine realm with a variety of gods and goddesses. Um, and in the biblical tradition within its own historical context, we have God and then the divine assembly or the angelic hosts that, uh, that are there at God's behest, standing by God and standing at God's behest to do God's bidding. And so in Genesis 1, um, yeah, all of the above. And I would also not want to um, exclude the earth and the waters in this as, as well. Um, how much of our bodies is composed of, of water? 70% or so. So, and, and our skin is like the crust of the earth. So I would say that even our bodies are imprinted with um, the image of the earth. And we get that more explicitly in the second creation account in which Adam is created out of the dust of the ground, this groundling um, tied to the ground. So, you know, I think to leave the question open, I would consider perhaps all of the above. It's inclusive. And, and leave it at that. So, Stephen, keep thinking about it and tell me later what you think. <laughs> okay, I sure will. Thank you very much, sir. I think George had a question as well. Yes, thank you, Steve, uh, for asking me that, that good question. And thank you, uh, Dr. Brown, uh, very much for your, your lecture to us tonight. And uh, you spoke just wonderfully about um, collaboration. And it, it's something I, I had not um, heard or read before, so it was very illuminating for me. But I picked up in your writing um, some more on a creation. You talked about the messiness of it and the experimentation and the amount of uh, death that was all involved in it. It reminded me very much of uh, Annie Dillard and some of her work. Um, but I, I wrote down uh, one, one phrase that you commented on that that in all this, God, God does not dominate. And um, I, I, thought, I was like, that really kind of blew my brain. It's like, well, it's the, it's the dominion of God, the kingdom of God. How does, how does God have dominion without domination? And you talked about differentiation instead of termination. And that differentiation was, a, uh, that was a, kind of a new concept for me. But it did kind of point me to like the, the servant ministry of Jesus uh, in the New Testament. But, but I'm still struck by that, that non-domination and differentiation. I was wondering, is there, is there anywhere else where those, uh, those concepts come up in, in, um, in biblical images or uh, narratives? Yeah, thank you, George. Um, I, um, you may be choosing from a variety of viewpoints that are expressed in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Certainly in Genesis 1, God sort of assumes the role as the cosmic king of the universe, issuing divine commands, let there be light, let the earth produce plant life. These are, these are royal commands with power that, to be sure, enlist other agents of power, the earth and the waters, um, to create life. So, so what I like to say, the difference between Genesis 1 and the garden story in Genesis 2 and 3 in terms of the image of God 
is that in Genesis 1, God is the king of the cosmos. Mm -hmm. And in Genesis 2, God is the king of the compost, working right. with, uh, with the ground, with soil, to plant a garden and to, to sculpt a human body from the, uh, the, the wet clay. Um, and, in, and in Genesis 2 and 3, we have a much more down-to-earth you might say vulnerable God who, who strolls in the evening breeze, uh, the cool of the day, uh, and asks questions. Where are you, um, Adam? Um, where is your brother, Cain? I hear the cry of his blood from the ground. God asks questions, uh, according to the Yahwist, um, which... Um, which you don't find in Genesis 1. God is only issuing commands. Uh, so, so Genesis 2 and 3, we do have sort of a non-domineering God at work, a God who is uh, open to experimenting because God gives freedom to these creatures. And so we have the serpent who is free to engage uh, the human couple. Uh, it's said that uh, uh, actually the first creature, the first the first voice in the Bible that talks about God is the serpent, which then makes the serpent as the first theologian in the Bible. Um, that's not original, that comes from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, so, so, and, but then in, in Job, um, I, would, I, I really press that case that God is not domineering in the book of Job uh, when God shows Job all of creation, because God is not trying to suppress any any creature of creation, even Leviathan, God is, I mean, God could, I suppose, uh, as it said that God could bring a sword to behemoth, but God doesn't. God refuses to do so. God instead allows these creatures to revel in their freedom. And for Leviathan, the only language of domination uh, in, in the picture of creation in the book of Job via God's answer to Job is Leviathan serving as, as king over all that are proud. So I, so I find that particularly striking, whereas in humanity in Genesis 1 is given the task and blessing of exercising dominion, but nothing of that is applied to humanity in God's uh, revelation of creation to Job. Rather, it is Leviathan that is given that top tier. And, uh, and all other creatures are, are sort of at this level playing field, uh, Job included. So, so you have different levels of domin. I actually don't like the term domination. I would say that God, in some traditions, is is sovereign. Yeah, but uh, but God's kingdom is unlike any kind of kingdom that we can imagine. Uh, it is a kingdom uh, that is ushered in by Jesus, as you mentioned, George. Uh, it is a kingdom that is filled with that is really a kingdom in which all people are kin and freedom reigns and dignity is possessed by all. Um, it is a non-hierarchical kingdom that I think is announced by Jesus, the kingdom that is at hand and the kingdom that is to come. Uh, thank you. Could you say just a little bit about differentiation? Thank you, yeah. So uh, if I recall correctly, that that is what I used for my exploration of Genesis 1 a bit, uh, that the process of creation that God institutes is one of separation and, and differentiation. So light is created out of darkness, day uh, separated from night, land from sea, uh, male and female. You might say that uh, Genesis 1 is filled with binaries. Um, and, and so in that process, there is this increased differentiation. All the creatures um, uh, procreate according to their kinds. Uh, the word kind, uh, not, not uh, sensitivity, but kind in terms of uh, speciation, uh, that, that runs rife throughout Genesis 1. That's part of the differentiation of creation as well. But, but George, you, you bring me to another point that uh, I'd like to uh, uh, just uh, uh, kind of lay out. I actually cut it for my presentation because I knew it was going on, going to go on too long, and it did go on too long anyway. Uh, but uh, when you have these binaries in Genesis 1, 
day and night, light and darkness, land and sea, male and female. Um, I think our ancient cosmologist also recognizes how those binaries get broken. So for instance, uh, day and night, uh, you already have a breaking of that binary when the author talks about morning and evening, or we might say dawn and dusk. That's sort of the blurry boundary between day and night and light and darkness. And, and land and sea. Uh, so in, in, on day three, the land emerges and separates the waters below, and they're contained within specific bodies of water, oceans and seas. But the cosmologists of the Bible also recognizes that there are places where land and sea coexist uh, and, um, and out of which emerge different ecosystems like marshes and estuaries and, and deltas. That's where land and sea come together to, to create something new, a different kind of ecosystem to their merging. So what about male and female? So we have that binary in Genesis 1. But it makes me wonder if we continue to extend the logic, the theologic of Genesis 1, to recognize that there, are, there is a spectrum of sexual and gendered uh, differences uh, that, that should be recognized and given equal dignity. That is to say, when Genesis 1 says that um, God created humanity in God's image, male and female, that it extends across gender and sexual differences as well. Uh, it is a democratization of the image of God that is shared by, by all people, every individual, uh, collectively and individually um, uh, within, within our gender differences, within our sexual differences. So, so these are binaries that begin to be tweaked, if not broken in Genesis 1, that we can extend uh, into our own um, theological dialogues together, or ethical dialogues together as well. Thanks to Genesis 1. Thank you very much. We may have time for one more question. Colette. Um, this was a fabulous, you did fabulous by the way. <laughs> um, so in your, in your book, I believe it was in chapter three, um, you talked about um, just as vegetation brought form to the formless, um, vegetation provided the basis for animal life. And a little bit later, it talked about um, religion wasn't, con religion wasn't there to, to not, to control the masses, but provided food for the masses. Um, and then when you talked about with Job, can you provide prey for the lion? In other words, I guess when I look at it from the food and faith aspect of when you look at the soil, like before the, before there was vegetation, um, and if there is this barrenness of the soil, then there will be no prey for the lion. And this calling, if you will, to heal the desecrated places is what, what Wendell Berry would say in that um, in this kind of return to the sacred. Um, could you speak to that? It wasn't really a question. <laughs> Just um... Yeah, yeah, thank you, Colette. Um, when I present this material to, to churches, um, when I talk about Genesis 1 and I end up with my, my, um, uh, my thesis that the message of Genesis 1 is that the creation, the universe, the cosmos is God's cosmic sanctuary or temple. I say, what, well, how would you react when you come to church on a Sunday morning uh, to worship and you're the first one there and um, the doors have been unlocked and you enter into your church's sanctuary and you see it sprayed with graffiti. That is, uh, the sanctuary has been effaced, if not defaced. Um, how would you feel? And folks say, well, pretty angry and upset. Um, uh, and so I say, well, maybe that's what we're doing with creation as well. 
we're defacing God's cosmic sanctuary, um, God's sanctuary on earth. Um, and that would make God pretty upset. And we should be pretty upset too. And, and we need to think of ways to repair that sanctuary uh, that God has created for the sustenance of our life and, and for the sake of joy. And we receive that in gratitude. And with gratitude comes responsibility. Um, so, so for me, the cosmic sanctuary image of Genesis 1 has very uh, pertinent ecological implications for, for how we uh, should conduct our lives um, together. Um, now, that, that doesn't endorse a particular strategy. I'm not here to talk about any action plans, uh, which are many, uh, to be sure. Uh, but uh, but, but I'm, I'm here to convince folks to look at creation in a different way, not as, um, not as a warehouse of resources, but as something living, as a community. Uh, for me, Aldo Leopold is also quite influential that even the ground is a community, the soil is a community. And what is the church for that community? The church is the beloved community for the biotic community. Uh, another way to put it is the church, I think the church's highest calling is to be a sign of the new creation. And that new creation is a crea creation that is reconciled, um, that is flourishing uh, to the max. And, and the church, our communities of faith, should work towards anticipating that and preparing for that and repairing that. Um, yeah, so, so that was one thing that your question um, spurred me to, to think of. Um, I forget what the rest of your question was now, Colette, forgive me. Um, was there, please follow up. Uh, what have I not responded? Well, just in the sense of looking at it through um, when God asked Job, can you provide prey for the oh. lion? I mean, that's... Right. Um... Yeah. So I think, actually, I think that's the most central question uh, that God poses to Job. Uh, because it's, it is a question that single-handedly turns Job's worldview upside down. Um, to add further background to that, uh, Job, in, at the prime of his life, likened himself to being a king, a king of the hill, his own community. Um, he talks about um, uh, being the king of his, uh, of his army and that uh, people would come to, up to him as a king uh, a uh, consoler in chief as well as a commander in chief. And he reveled in that. Um, he, he, he flourished in this uh, community uh, society built on honor and shame. Um, and, and friendship determined in this, uh, in this context of honor and shame. If, if you want to know, to know more about that, ask Dr. Vesely, who's an expert on friendship in the book of Job. Uh, and I've learned greatly from her work in that regard. But, uh, but it is a kind of skewed kind of friendship that, that Job enjoys the most, where he is top gun. He's top of the food chain. Uh, he's the top of the hierarchy within his stratified society. And so when God asks, presents to him the lion, and particularly when God challenged Job earlier to gird up his loins and, uh, and question me, God invites Job to do, Job is expecting God to say, can you kill the lion like any good king of the ancient Near East, like Ashurbanipal or any pharaoh or any king of Babylon uh, who, who prided themselves on the hunting grounds as well as in the battlefield, as well, for, as, well as in the garden uh, as well, the royal gardens. So when God asked Job, can you provide for the lion? Can you hunt prey for the lion? Job's expectations are blown apart. His role, or his, his invited role, is to provide, not to kill. And, and to kind of press that further, I hadn't really thought about it, but who's best for hunting prey for the lion? A lion. And so I wonder if God is inviting Job to look at the world through the eyes of the lion uh, in that regard, as God invites Job to look Look at the city through the eyes of the onager. Look at the city as a place of chaos and the wilderness as a place of wonder and provision 
as the onager, the wild ass enjoys. So I think one of the, one of the strategies of God in God's answer to Job is to force Job to look at the world through the eyes of these wild animals, to begin to identify with them um, and to see the wilderness as a place of God's grace where God is actively sustaining life and allowing freedom and dignity to reign among these creatures that uh, any king would hunt down, that Job would disparage. Uh, another point, if, if Barry Huff is still there, uh, whose wonderful work on the priestly language uh, in the book of Job. Um, these, these animals are unclean. And so they are, in a sense, untouchable for Job. And yet God includes them as part of God's wild kingdom, of God's cherished children, if you will. And, uh, and some of these animals, particularly like the war horse and behemoth and leviathan, they are almost described with divine-like language. They're almost really theophonic uh, in scale compared to humanity. So which, which goes back to another point is that, um, well, let me quote Irenaeus, that famous line that the glory of God is the human being fully alive. Well, God would say in Job that, uh, that the glory of God is all of creation fully alive, fully flourishing. And that uh, it's created, all of that is created in God's image, or at least imprinted with God's glory. So, yeah, so as God's glory, creation must be provided for. Creation must flourish. And to bring in the Psalms, like Psalm 148, in which all of creation is giving praise to God, um, it is our role you, made it, you might say it is our role of dominion, if I may use that term from Genesis 1. It is our role of dominion to ensure that all of creation can give praise to God. That uh, we, our dominion role is an enabling role. Uh, it is a serving role as Adam in Genesis 2 verse 7 to, to serve and to preserve, uh, to, to keep and to preserve um, the soil for the benefit of all life, plant life and animal life. Uh, it, is a, it is a dominion of service. It is a dominion of enabling all creation to give praise. And for Job, uh, it, is a, it is a creation uh, that gives, that exhibits, that reflects God's glory. Or might, I might say refracts God's glory as we are to refract God's image to the world. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown, for your, your time and your thoughtfulness. Um, uh, thank you also to the Demon students who are panelists here. Um, just so everyone else knows, we have come tonight having read several chapters of Dr. Brown's book, The Seven Pillars of Creation, The Bible, Science, and the Ecology of Wonder. Uh, and we certainly recommend that to all of you. So. Uh, now I'm gonna hand it off to President Hill. Well, kudos there, Nathan. I too, Dr. Brown, am very grateful for you providing us a new paradigm through which to see the book of Job and to keep the scriptures ever fresh and enlightening and inspiring. Thank you, sir, and to the panelists. And to each of you who joined us, I think we reached a maximum of 60 participants this evening. And once again, we must say how grateful we are for the legacy and memory of our president emeritus, Dr. Bill Ingram, and his lovely wife, Virginia, whose legacy lives on through the Ingram Lectures. God bless you all, thank you. And at this time, Dr. Gatke is gonna lead us in a closing prayer. unless Navea had a need that he had to step away with momentarily. And that could certainly be the case with the young uh, one at home. So um, with that, with Dr. Gatke away, it would be my pleasure to close us in our benediction tonight. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we are grateful for this time that we have shared and grown in our understanding of the vastness 
of your love and grace for all of creation. Will you inspire us as your hands and feet, even as we embrace the mission of our institution to live beyond ourselves through scholarship, piety, and justice, as we would say in a practical sense, to be the head, the heart, and hand as we serve this world to your glory. We pray your blessing on each of our students who have grown this evening through this experience and all of us who have been challenged to live in this world as those who have been blessed by your grace and be grace to those around us. In the name of Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. And let me say how grateful I am to have participated in this. Thank you, President Hill. Thank you, President Hill. Um, thank you to uh, Dr. Vesely and for Nathan and for Peter and for all of you who have been involved in bringing me here. Uh, I've learned much myself. Uh, this is Great. the true nature of dialogue. And I pray that we all go forth in wonder, love, and praise from Amen. here on out. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, sir. God bless you. Well done, team.